All right, so we are now live, and I am here with uh, Miles Neal, and we are celebrating this week um, our the launch of our print journal Tarka, the journal Tarka, which I have here in my hand. This is uh, one of the issues, um, uh, is a is a journal that we've been publishing for a couple of years now as a digital offering, um, but the last several months we've been working very hard to, to um, create a, a very beautiful document that you can hold in your hands um, to feature the writings of our um, wonderful contributors and uh, the friends of embodied philosophy. So this week we're, we're celebrating this issue which is on Bhakti um, by uh, interviewing, I, I'm interviewing several of the contributors on Monday. I spoke to Nina Rao and we did a little kirtan here at my place. You can find that on Facebook now as well as on YouTube. Uh, on Tuesday, I met with Hari Kirtan Kirtana Das, and we went into, dove deep into some of the uh, kind of philosophical questions around um, uh, bhakti. And then on Wednesday, I spoke to Mary Riley Nichols, and we talked about uh, bhakti from a fairly erotic perspective. So that was very fun. Check that out. Mary's always a great time. And then Thursday, yesterday, I spoke to Kavita Chanayan um, about uh, bhakti from uh, the perspective of, 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 a, of a Shaiva Shakta, but really kind of looking at Bhakti as this is a, as a sort of quality that isn't sectarian. And today, as I talk to Miles Neal, we're gonna continue a bit in, um, of that kind of understanding of devotion and Bhakti, because of course, um, uh, these qualities can be found in all um, wisdom esoteric traditions. Miles is a, um, representative of a Buddhist lineage. And so we'll talk a little bit about that in the context of, of pilgrimage, which is the, the article that he wrote was on pilgrimage. I will just uh, mention the title, which is The Power of Pilgrimage, Sacred Rite and Paradigm Therapy. And uh, the article, which is very interesting, beautifully written, Miles is a great writer, ends with um, a, a sort of consideration of paradigm therapy, which I think is one of the kind of most um, innovative, interesting ideas that uh, that Miles uh, discusses in his article. Um, but before we get into the, all that, hello, Miles, how are you? Hey, Jacob, nice to see you. And thank you again for inviting me and um, asking me to participate in all the good things that you're doing. And also congratulations on Tarka. And I always think that you guys um, offer such high quality uh, promote, you know, uh, programs and Tarka is no different. So thank you for inviting me to, to contribute. It's quite an honor and congratulations on all that you're doing and all the expansion of embodied philosophy. You're really, really a remarkable, uh, you know, uh, leader. So thank you, Jacob. Oh, thanks, Miles. I can always count on you to flatter uh, so well. <laughs> and you're stunningly um, beautiful on top of it all. <laughs> now okay. I got you blushing. <laughs> <laughs> I am blessing. At some point, I'm just going to combine all those audios of you flattering me and play them on repeat to self-affirmation. Um, so, so um, you know, we were talking before we came live about whether or not we should talk about the coronavirus. And it's a big present on our mind, and it's becoming more and more present in our minds. And so it seems almost irresponsible not even to mention it um, in a live uh, session like this. So what are some of your thoughts as it relates to you know, from a spiritual perspective or from the perspective of, of teachings, I mean, what, what, what are some of the teachings that we have available to us that can help us in a time like this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, I mean, everything becomes secondary. This is a, this is a major global threat, and I'm not I'm trying to be alarmist. I don't think we, it's not dramatic. I think we need to be, as, as people in positions of leadership amongst our own networks, we need to be very clear and send the message that we are not in denial about the ramifications of what is uh, amidst us. Uh, and at the same time, we also need to, you know, exercise the kind of uh, embodiment of um, presence, um, calm. Um, you know, we have to have, you know, our prefrontal cortex has to be online. We have to uh, offer a kind of, you know, a, a vibration that is forward moving, I think. And so, you know, one the well, first thing I want to say is I don't, I want to cut through the denial. We're, we are, this is a crisis. This is probably a, a far more enduring uh, crisis. It'll probably be a convergence of crisis. There will be not only the pandemic, but an economic uh, shockwave. And so yeah. uh, I think we have to do that first and foremost is cut through the denial. And, you know, most of the people in my network and most of the people in your network 
uh, are of a demographic of a spiritual inclination. And so what the fuck have we been practicing for? You know, like, here's the time. This is go time. Okay, so we are actually in a very unique position to uh, actually walk the talk and everything that we have done in terms of our yoga practice and our study and our embodiment and, you know, refining our vagal nerve and, uh, and, and, and also investing in a, a much broader, much more flexible perspective of reality. All of that comes into play now. So, you know, we may have just enjoyed a lar- long period of safety and abundance in which we were kind of lax about our practice. It may have been more armchair practice. And, and now it is time to go to work kids. Um, now it's time to really understand that the, the practice of yoga, the practice of Buddhism, the practice of any Dharma practice, any spiritual wisdom, uh, it, is, it has been designed to stay resilient and to also turn your heart inside out. This is not just about you. This is about your network. Uh, whatever sphere of influence you have, you, you, everybody must uh, be a leader now. Everybody has to contribute now. And in order to get that kind of forward movement and that buoyancy, uh, we have to have one foot deeply entrenched in our wisdom tradition and the other foot exercising compassion amongst the, the people who may not be as resilient, may not be as grounded, uh, may not be as uh, deeply um, invested in their studies. And so they're, they're the more vulnerable ones. And so we have to straddle these two worlds. Hmm. So what is, in what ways does our practice actually help us at a time like this? And how can we use the cumulative effects of our practice to help others and to serve? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, I mean, I, I was... To be perfectly honest, because I'm also in the role of a therapist, I'm fielding a lot of anxious yeah. phone calls right now. It's it's just the social contagion of fear right now is, is yeah. what I'm trying to cut through. And, and it has never been at the same time as feeling and fielding a lot of that anxiety. It's never been um, more clear what the concept or the notion of emptiness really means, because I, I, I after, after, after a full day of work and feeling a lot of phone calls and managing um, uh, contingency plans amongst my network uh, post uh, Trump's announcement uh, and the uh, stock market crash, um, it never became more clear just how illusory a lot of these things are. We have been living in a fantasy. And then some people that are feeling really debased and grounded and they're, they've lost half their income and they, they start to see that they're, they're more vulnerable than they actually thought they were. And that, you know, the, the shelves are clearing and, uh, you know, things are falling apart on every level, microscopic to macroscopic. It is disintegrating. We are in disintegration. And so if you don't have a Dharma practice and you don't understand emptiness and you don't understand the fluidity na- of, na- of, 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 of things and you don't understand the impermanence of things, uh, then your nervous system is going to get the best of you because you go scrambling for security yeah, and you yeah. go to buttress yourself against the against the, uh, the potential demise into the void, uh, into, the, into the cavern, into the ca- you know, under, the, under the pressures of the cataclysm. And mm. so this is when it's really important to see the, 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 that things have been largely a construction, a fabrication. Uh, the fact that, that uh, we have always been um, amidst impermanence, but now it's just very clear and apparent. And so, you know, part of it is to remain calm and centered that, you know, we have basically everything we need. And those things that we don't need are really, you know, shifting right in front of us. I mean, we need such basic things right now. Our, our, right now, our nervous system with one breath. And linking eyes, I see you, you have a beautiful face. I see you're not afraid, Jacob. You can offer me a smile. I can offer you a smile. We can slow the conversation down. We are okay now. Mm -hmm. So it's not to go too far into emptiness to say this is all an illusion, it's all just a a masquerade, it's all a play, and it's also not to go the other direction where we buttress down in a bunker, totally afraid, we're gonna lose it all, we're gonna all die. Right in the middle, 
the tectonic plates are shifting and we have the inner resources, we have exactly what we need. Everything else has been an extraneous construction, you know, part of a fabricated life that we thought actually, you know, wasn't all that satisfying anyway. I mean, I see so many advantages and possibilities amidst this crisis right now. They are dawning on me like popcorn. Mm. So do you think that the, um, you know, the reaction of the, you know, what, whether or not it's warranted, uh, which of course it is because it is a legitimate threat, we're not denying that. Um, but do you think that, you know, were these, you know, contemplative practices to be more widely disseminated, would the kind of reaction that we're seeing on a global scale, um, aside from just the the fear, would we see a different kind of response, do you think, in terms of, you know, closing down borders, stopping flights, um, which seems to, in a certain way, also, in a kind of sense, compound um, it's sort of like a self-perpetuating kind of situation where, where the fear compounds even more when these sort of drastic measures are taken by governments, um, even though they may be needed to, you know, to control the spread. Um, thoughts on that? I mean, you, you know me, and I think we share a common perspective that there are multiple paradigms and multiple complex um, perspectives. To have an integrated uh, perspective, a holistic perspective means that there's multiple multiple dimensions to be um, to be taken into consideration and addressed. So like bio biomedically, yes, I mean, there is a pandemic and there are the, the, the science is pretty clear about how you know we see from South Korea and uh, from China, you know, we're learning very quick, quickly as a collective species what best practices are needed. Okay, yeah. so that's one perspective. And it, it works very congruently with trauma perspective, like the best way to deal with a threat is to stay calm, to connect with each other, to use vagal tone, to use communication and intonation, to see each other's faces, even if we can't do that socially, now that there's social distancing, we should do it online and take full advantage of technology. We need to communicate. We need to collaborate. We will problem solve better if we co-regulate. So that's the trauma perspective. And then from a spiritual perspective, yes. I mean, we need to also recognize like the constructive nature of things, that this is this whole facade of the economy that's going to collapse. Everything collapses. It wasn't that good anyway. This, this, is, this is a doorway through the bardo. The death is not the end. Death is the new beginning. Uh, mm. Brace yourselves for impact, but then also see the reward of going, you know, we have to burn down the, the field in order to grow. I mean, everybody has, you know, in my circle, we speak spiritually about the new world. We're developing the new world. Well, it all sounds nice until you have to also recognize that creating new also means going through death. Mm. And so, so from a spiritual point of view, they talk about death all the time. Well, death is painful. Uh, so, so the reality of death means that things will dissolve, people will die, or we will lose loved ones. Uh, the world that we know it will disintegrate. You know, and, but we wanted that, didn't we? We didn't think that the economic system was socially viable for the mass majority of people. And we were asking for change. Well, what does change require, Jacob? It requires that something has to go. And if that thing goes, is it gonna just be in the snap of a finger? No. And is it gonna happen at no risk and no toll to people? No. And so listen, be careful what you ask for. It's time to be a big grown up, big girl and big boy right now. These are the things that we were wanting for. We wanted a shift in perspective. We talked about a paradigm shift. Well, does it just miraculously appear out of the ether at no toll? Absolutely not. And so now it's time to go through it and it might be an enduring situation. And so having a spiritual perspective is absolutely essential for the long range view of what is actually happening right now. Mm. Beautiful.
Wow, powerfully said. So let's now go a little bit into your article. And of course, um, pilgrimage at this moment might not be on the list of advised activities. Yeah, um, you just have but, to get creative with pilgrimage. We might not be going all the way to the Indian uh, subcontinent, but we, we're going well, to vir, vir, we'll have to take heroes' journeys and virtual pilgrimages together. Exactly. Well, that's what I wanted to really talk about is really like what, because of course, the, the pilgrimage, while it is an um, oftentimes an external activity and you've been taking um, groups to physical places, um, but it is also an internal journey as well, as I understand it. So can you talk a little bit about that and the way that we could actually continue to, um, to align with this spirit of pilgrimage even when we are on lockdown? Yeah. I mean, the sadness is, is you know, in the relative things, there are, uh, there are definitive distinctions. So I'm not going to pretend right. that everything should sure. There's no, there's no substitute for an actual physical pilgrimage to a holy site. From a conventional reality standpoint, that relative uh, experience is, is it's unique unto itself. Yeah. In the same way that I would say there's no substitute for one-on-one -on -one individual therapy live in person. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, you can get remarkable results working online and that's just the new reality of the near future we're gonna to have to work a lot more effectively online but you yourself i've noticed on embodied philosophy have started retreats online i'm sure you agree with me there's no substitute for an in-person retreat but yeah. you know there are advantages and now that's clear more than ever that we have to move online so i'm i'm not going to sit here and say there is, um, you know, there's nothing unique and special about going to a holy site like Bodh Gaya or some of the places that you've traveled to where in, in, inevitably a, 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 a long lineage of, of intense practitioners, including great masters who have awakened, have done practices at those sites. Uh, li thousands of years of lineage of devoted practitioners have done the most sincere practices. Those places are imbued with, um, palpable and visceral real energy and 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 one can feel that and tap that as one taps a nectar source uh, so i'm not going to pretend uh, that we can uh, approximate that online but what i would say is we can up the dimension and go more uh, philosophical or um you know we can we can we can look at it from another point of view and as a metaphor let's say that the pilgrimage represents a rites of passage Okay, the pilgrimage represents uh, what Campbell, Joseph Campbell called a hero's journey. And the hero's journey and the rites of passage have three phases that are uh, common and aligned. The first phase is the departure, the second phase is the initiation, and the third phase is the return. Okay, and the Tibetans in their um, near death or, or death experience, death bardo, rebirth, have the same three phases. And so what I would suggest from a spiritual point of view, we are in the departure stage right now as a human family. I mean, if it's true that this is one of the, this is possibly since, you know, the Spanish flu epidemic of, um, of the last century, this is, this is, a, this is a, an, uh, an unprecedented, if not a, one of the large scale uh, human crises we've experienced in the last century. Let's put it in that context. And then let's add to it that we're probably going to be followed with another shockwave and tsunami with an economic um, collapse, which I actually think is probably right on. I mean, from the astrological point of view, that's definitely what they've been anticipating for years now. And so, so let's say that that's all the dissolution phase. That's all the death phase. There's going to be physical death. There's going to be human loss. There's going to be loss of income. There's going to be loss of social systems. There's going to be loss of governmental agencies there, this is going to be a, a dissolution, an undoing, okay? And, and for most people, they will become traumatized and terrified and paralyzed. And so they will buckle down just as if you were physically dying, people resist change. But the spiritually inclined and the spiritually informed and those that have, that have prepared spiritually, uh, those people will start to recognize the signs of dissolution and their training will kick in. Just as a Navy, deal, a Navy SEAL diver with his or her advanced training, once they're underwater for over a period of, of a minute or so, their survival instincts will be subdued and they will, they will cool, calm, and collected, handle the situation much better as a result of training. 
And so in that middle phase, we, we, are, we will be amidst a, an initiation. Now it's time to really uh, uh, dust off all our Bhagavad Gita. Now's the time to dust off the Dhammapada. Now's the time to dust off all our asanas. Now's the time to get together with our networks and get very creative and subscribe to embodied philosophy's next course, you know? Really, I'm, I'm not trying to plug you. I mean, it puts into very sharp perspective the expendable income, what we usually spend on, what will matter now, get very clear about your priorities. If you needed to pinch your pennies now, What's going to be the top three things that you need to do? Well, you're going to need to get food and shelter. You're going to need to take care of your health and basic necessities. Uh, you're going to have to continue to work from home. But then anything after that, I mean, are you going to invest in Netflix or are you going to invest in something worthwhile that will keep your Vegas uh, tone primed and give you a constructive, positive outlook so that you can reframe the initiation phase of what's about to happen in the most optimal manner? And then if you're going to be part of that contingency, then you'll be a leader or a steward in the reconstructive effort. And, and we won't go back to the old world. We will actually be participants in the construction of a new, more equitable world, the one that everybody was out there going, hoo hoo, rah, rah, we want change. But those people haven't nearly been prepared. Those, I, I guarantee you, 80% of those people that were out there on the front lines cheering for activism have not prepared their nervous system and are not prepared spiritually to survive the first round of the collapse, their nervous system will collapse and they will be paralyzed and fearful. And they're not really ready to handle this spiritually. That's my inclination. As sad as that might sound, I'm just trying to be realistic with you. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, I wanna get your, uh, cause I wanna close this down within um, the next 10 minutes, just because I've promised to try to keep these at 30. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, uh, devotion in the midst of all of this, if we can find a way of of bringing that concept in, um, just to tie it back a little bit to the uh, to the topic of the issue. Um, in, I mean, if you want to speak it, to it in the context of what we're talking about with this, you know, obviously um, uh, incredibly um, crucial time. How does devotion play a role? I mean, we've been talking about the cultivation of the nervous system um, and, and of course, contemplative practice and, and the toning of the vagal nerve. These are all tied together. But where does devotion fit in um, uh, into this puzzle? Yeah, I mean, so for, you know, in bhakti, devotion is the key word in uh, Tibetan tantric uh, parlance. Devotion is a very key word for everybody else. Maybe refuge is a good word. Um, you know, the idea here is amidst a storm, where do you go for shelter? You know, when it gets hard and rough and it gets dark or bleak, when your nervous system is tanking, what are the most reliable sources that you're going to rely on to keep yourself buoyant and your perspective open and actually be constructive and an active member in the constructive? So, you know, for most people, that's their spiritual lineage. And that may be first and foremost in the most immediate way. That might be your spiritual teacher. Okay, so you, through the devotion is what opens your heart and lubricates your attention so that you're more receptive to that message. It's almost like there's an electric current and you need to plug in. Devotion is the plugging in. Yeah. You, you, want, uh, you want inspiration. You want support. You want guidance, you want buoyancy, you want direction. Everybody wants that. So who are you listening to? Well, right now in the, in the pandemic, actually a lot of people are turning to the uh, health researchers and the scientists. Yeah. And they're practicing devotion, aren't they? I mean, we could say that's like a mundane devotion because they don't know this, the actual facts themselves. They're looking to someone who knows. You know, and maybe this is not the time to turn to other people like presidents, for example, I won't mention who, but now maybe, maybe it's the time to turn to people who actually have spent their entire lives looking at the details and the fine tune and, and have a, a very constructive message based on facts and evidence. But spiritually, who are we turning to? And spiritually, what do they have to say? And so that's, devotion is what allows us to connect to people, institutions, uh, texts, uh, perspectives, paradigms that are going to actually serve us in the midst of this transition. Mm, mm, 
Yeah, that's really powerful. So I want to end on um, something that you've already discussed and that, that I mentioned at the beginning. And that is this um, topic of paradigm therapy, which again, like I said, you've already sort of touched upon it a little bit, but can you um, uh, uh, describe what paradigm therapy is in comparison to, I don't know, what people would typically associate with the term therapy? What, are, what is the kind of nature of that um, particular um, practice of therapy? Okay, well, I mean, you and I have shared in common since we've known each other a, um, a, a our, we've been outspoken about our reservations about modern materialistic, the modern materialistic paradigm and its shortcomings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about at a symptomatic level, there are problems with social systems. At a personal level, there are, there are traumatic problems that we have to deal with. But from a systemic or global perspective, there, is, there are paradigm problems that need to be addressed. Like our worldview is problematic. The fact that we reduce everything to matter is substantially causing a lot of the uh, strain on our daily lives. But those things go unrecognized because they're so close. We're, we're so close. It's, it's, all, it's, it's part of our blind spot. Our worldview is out of, out of vision, out of view. And so my attempt to call out paradigm is to say, well, everybody's working on the personal level in trauma therapy. Everybody's working on social systems level, but how many of us are really um, calling out the deeper implication as the Buddhists and the Hindus did for a long time, they were talking about worldview. They were talking yeah. about our worldview is corrupted and it, and it is the fundamental klesha. It is the mulla klesha, the, the deepest root affliction is our worldview. And now we get a chance to call out materialism as too myopic, too reductionistic, and very much contributing to societal and personal illness and disease and breakdown. And now's the time in the midst of this transition to make sure when we reboot, let's reboot from a much greater perspective, one that includes interdependence, emptiness, openness, compassion, interdependence, uh, really sees that the world is 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 much more uh, quantum and much more based on karma. Uh, then and then we will if we reboot reboot with that platform, we'll get a much more robust way of living together in the new world. Fantastic. So. Um... Those that are with us live, if you have any questions for Miles, um, I see a few of you here on Zoom with us. If you have any questions for Miles, you can certainly ask them in the chat. Um, and if not, that's okay too. I'm just gonna mention one more time um, that we are here today celebrating the launch of our journal Tarka, which you can see here. And, um, and you can get uh, the issue with, of course, Miles' wonderful article in it um, from embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. It's available as both a digital and a print offering, either as a single issue or as a subscription. Um, so, Miles, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? You know, this has been really powerful. I'm glad this is this is closing the week of interviews with um, something very prescient and and powerful. So, thank you for always bringing it home, uh, taking it to, to the real. And um, do you have any final thoughts, reflections on you know either what we've been discussing in relation to um, the pandemic situation or bhakti devotion more generally? Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to reiterate, you know, just so we're clear, and we can repeat the, the key, the key sentiment that I'm coming from is now is the time to take refuge, guys. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a spiritual practice, go deep into your spiritual practice, take care of your basic needs, and go deep into your spiritual practice for yourself. But then you, each of us become a refuge for other people who don't have a spiritual practice. So it is no longer acceptable to just do your spiritual practice for yourself. You also need to be a refuge, a source of buoyancy, a source of comfort or ease, because we are a vast network and there are many, many people less resourced than us. And we need to think of them. There are more vulnerable populations. There are elderly, there are uh, sick, there are people who are not uh, into contemplative um, matters. There are people that are ill-prepared. Uh, we need to think about them. And so I think it's a very important strategy 
that networks, spiritual networks, like my contemplative studies program, Jacob, and your embodied philosophy, we need to work together so that we create a wider network effect where people can fall back into our programming and because we are gonna offer the best kind of resources for people in terms of their nervous system. You and I both share an interest in making sure that we have the trauma base covered, the body-based somatics covered, the spiritual. We are fully integrated and fully prepared for this transition. And so together we need to link networks. And so I'm, I'm very much interested after we have this call, we make sure that we understand how we're gonna do that together uh, because let's not work in silos, neither as individuals, nor as communities or networks, uh, this is the time to really get very creative and put a plan into action. Mm, excellent. Okay, well, I've been speaking with Miles Neal, and uh, Miles is the author, uh, by the way, of Gradual Awakening. Awakening. It's a really beautiful book that you should get your hands on if you haven't already. And Miles, your, your website is milesneal.com? milesneal.com and my uh, contemplative studies program is gradualpath.com. And there you'll find uh, mo per, you know, smaller modules on trauma, how to, how to, how to get through trauma resilience and, uh, and use uh, Buddhist cont contemplation to, to you know, sort of take agency in your life or the larger program that I'm talking about, which we are really building out in midst this crisis right now to really serve as a kind of community forum and community support. We're, you know, I'm sure just like you, Jacob, we're taking, uh, taking proactive initiative to make sure that we up our game here online uh, mm. in preparation for what's about to happen. Excellent. Well, Miles, thank you so much for your time. Jacob, thank you and all the best. <laughs>